This end of the periodic table is quite interesting. It has elements such as sodium, which is incredibly soft. So soft, in fact, they can be cut with a knife. Sodium is better known for its reactivity. If you plop some in water, it reacts violently. Sodium is relatively cheap, and as reactive as it is, there are more reactive elements below it. These metals are more expensive and harder to get, but we can make them. And that's the plan today. We will design and build a device that turns cheaper reactive metals such as sodium, lithium, and calcium into potassium, cesium, and even rubidium. The conversion for one reactive metal into another is called a displacement reaction. For example, let's produce potassium. On one side we have our reactants, potassium chloride and calcium metal. By heating these, the calcium metal takes the place of the potassium in the chloride, displacing it and forming calcium chloride. The newly displaced potassium is now free in its elemental form, which we want. We can then collect our potassium through distillation. The reaction normally favors that production of calcium metal, not potassium. But because we're boiling off the potassium as soon as it's produced, we can collect the potassium. Using this theory, we can produce any alkali metal that we want. Now that we have our theory down, we can design a reaction vessel. When it comes to making equipments for reaction, we need to know a few things, like the goal in mind. In our case, producing and separating is our goal, and it needs to be reusable. This means we need a way to cause a reaction and then separate our products. In the lab, we can use a distillation setup. On one side, we produce a product, then exploit the boiling point to separate our product. Using this idea, we can modify it to work for us. As safe as glass is, in our scenario, some alkali metals will react with the glass, which is terrible to say the least. Also, operating temperatures would cause a huge problem. This leaves metal as a good option. Metal is strong, won't crack on us, and it's non-reactive to our reaction. We can use iron or an alloy to improve our vessel strength. For this purpose, I will use stainless steel. It'll do the job excellently. The steel chrome alloy allows for non-reactivity, thermal resistance, and reusability. Stainless steel is commonly used in piping, so common enough that it can be bought at hardware stores. In one visit, you have almost everything you need to produce this reaction vessel. Here we have our parts needed for our reaction side. We have a pipe cap, a pipe, and a flange. Now onto the distillation side, we have another flange, a pipe reducer, then a 90 degree reducer. This leads to our condensing tube, which then goes into a T-fitting. On one side it has a barb and on the other a pipe with a cork. The barb will allow for argon to be inputted to protect the reactive materials from the air. The cork will be used to connect the reactor to a collection vessel. The reason I chose flanges to connect the two sides is for a few reasons. The first, easy filling. The large opening allows reactants to be put in easily. Secondly, the large opening allows for cleaning for disassembly. If I wanted to use a wire wheel on the inside to clean, I can. When it comes to pipes, as you thread and unthread them, it creates wear. The tightness needed to prevent leaks also requires a lot of torque. Doing this over and over leads to higher wear and tear. And bolts are cheap and can be replaced if needed. If a bolt was to seize up, it's cheaper just to cut the bolt than to cut apart the whole reaction vessel. I could not find thread sealant that exceeds the temperatures needed for our reaction, so I had to weld the parts together. I was hoping to make this as DIY friendly as possible, but it was needed after during leak testing, it leaked constantly. I never welded stainless steel before, so I didn't want to, and this is my first time doing it, so it's not my best work. Here is the final reaction vessel. I need heat to drive the reaction forward and also to distill it. For this purpose, I will use my propane furnace, which gets nice and hot. 
The only downside of this is that it's not very controllable. It's either on or off. I would like to use an electric furnace, but my last one melted and I haven't replaced it yet. Now it's time to make some potassium. I will pour 40 grams of potassium chloride and 20 grams of calcium into layers into the reaction chamber. The system is then purged with argon. And the flanges are sealed together. It's now time for heating. For the production of potassium, we will ramp up the temperature to above 800 degrees Celsius, 1500 degree freedom units. During the run, positive pressure argon will be held in the vessel to prevent oxygen from entering. The argon will also purge the reaction vessel and the container that the potassium is coming over into, keeping it nice and clean. Soon after heating, we see potassium come over. We want to keep the condenser cool enough to condense the potassium vapor, but warm enough to keep it as a liquid. Solidification will clog the tube, which could cause problems. The nice thing about argon is the potassium is shiny and will remain shiny as we collect it. Watching the container fill up with this shiny reactive metal is quite fun. Unfortunately, the argon purge did not go as well as I wanted to, and a bit of oxides formed. After a while, the reaction started to slow, eventually stopping. This means the reaction is done. By no means the potassium that came out of here is the yield that I was expecting. There was also some white vapor coming out, so I think there's a small leak in the reaction vessel. I disconnected the Florence flask from the reaction vessel and poured a little bit of mineral oil onto it. Because some oxides formed, I wanted to clean it up before putting it into a vial. I cleaned it by taking the Florence flask filled with mineral oil, adding a bit more, and then placing it on a hot plate. I added a couple drops of isopropyl alcohol to this. I then put a stir bar in and stirred it up aggressively. I then took the stir bar back out and let it cool back down, but slowly enough that it collected up into small globules. It took way too long to collect into any large globules, so I just poured it out once it, the small ones solidified. I took a pair of tweezers and pulled out the small globules and put them into a vial and then topped it off with mineral oil. Here's our final potassium. Yes, it does react with water quite violently. The reaction vessel held up quite well, but we can see that there's some rust and some coloring to the material. This is because of that leak I was talking about earlier. I'm thinking this can be fixed by grinding down the flanges a bit more and tightening the bolts much tighter. There's a lot of small modifications to this vessel that I want to do, and as it's experimental, I still have a lot that I want to change. I've only done about three tests with it, so I've learned a lot in those tests, and I want to modify a bunch of it so it makes better alkali metals. In the next video, I'll use it probably to make cesium or rubidium. I don't know, but I've been told uranium ore is worth more than gold. I sold my cad, I bought me a jeep, I got that bug, and I can't sleep. Uranium fever has gone and gone.